On January 22nd, 2024, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a ruling allowing U.S. Border Patrol agents, who are federal agents, to remove the razor wire set up by the state of Texas along the Mexican border. National borders are the responsibility of the federal government to oversee and provide security for, as per the U.S. Constitution. But I'll tell you what isn't the responsibility of the federal government, liking this video and commenting down below. Texas Governor Greg Abbott responded yesterday with a social media post proclaiming that Texas's fight to secure its border is not over, and since the ruling, more razor wire has been installed along the southern border. It's not a secret that the journey from many Latin American countries onto U.S. soil is perilous and migrants are putting themselves and their family at immense risk when making the journey here. Dehydration and drowning are major risk factors regarding this trek, and for those who decide to pay a coyote or smuggler to take them across the border, they are also at risk of being trafficked, assaulted, or worse, seeing as they have no leverage and are frequently exploited by these cartels and other crime-fueled syndicates. The Supreme Court is the highest court in the land, and it would normally strike me as bizarre that a governor would openly defy an order from the SCOTUS, but in this case, there was a bit of precedent sent by our current president, Joe Biden. Now, why am I bringing up Joe Biden? Is this Biden derangement syndrome? Am I ultra MAGA and just frothing at the mouth to engage in whataboutisms? Hardly. The aforementioned Supreme Court last June struck down President Biden's student loan forgiveness package plan. Now, even if you oppose the methodology being used here, i.e. the razor wire, you can't deny that something has to be done about the influx of migrants from the southern border. This became readily apparent when governors, including Abbott, started busing migrants to major cities in northern states, including Chicago and New York City. The massive influx of people led to on-the-fly decisions being made, like putting them in luxury hotels or any available housing, really, until they could figure out how to get them home. President Biden has pushed for more border security measures, including denying asylum to economic migrants who skip a safe nation to get to the U.S., but it ultimately falls short when these policies are competing with human instinct and economic desperation. I grew up on the southern border. I lived near it for 27 years, and there are unique challenges that arrive when you receive large amounts of economic migrants from third world or developing countries. First, let's talk about schools. I was a teacher for seven years, and two of those years were spent teaching in a border town. If you are an aspiring teacher and want to teach at the elementary level in a border town, start brushing up on your Spanish, because in many of these towns, the local ISD will probably require or strongly recommend an applicant to be bilingually certified before being given a teaching contract. And the certification is only awarded after the applicant passes a written and oral exam, which has actually even been failed by citizens who grew up in Spanish-speaking households. Weird. Bizarre. This isn't only limited to early childhood or elementary education. Middle school administrations also push their candidates or onboard teaching staff to pursue ESL or bilingual certification. Oftentimes, this is listed as preferred on the job listing itself. And in many cases, your pedagogical knowledge and hunger to teach young minds will probably not beat out a no-experience applicant with a bilingual certification. This isn't punitive by any means. It is an actual need. When I was a substitute, substitute teacher, I saw firsthand that the language barrier is insane in some border towns, to the point where some campuses have entire homerooms of kids who don't know any English, to the point where most instruction at the pre-K through second grade level is actually done in Spanish. Fundamentals are important, and they can't just not teach kids who are enrolled in the district. What I just described is what I witnessed in 2015 through 2017. At the tail end, that's already seven years that have already passed. And this crisis just continues to grow when it isn't being used as a political football for gubernatorial and presidential elections. Does anybody have any real solutions in mind, like a pathway to citizenship? No. Now to conclude with what I personally think would be should be done to mitigate this crisis. Seeking asylum typically implies that the person is fleeing religious, racial, or other forms of persecution from their country of origin's government or overall populace. The main idea is for them to arrive at a safe or non-hostile nation and declare their need for refuge and be granted it. What it does not mean is any economic migrant has the right to pass through multiple safe zones to arrive at the U.S. In 2018, Mexico's president offered migrants who were a part of the Central American caravan temporary jobs and identification papers if they choose to, chose to ap apply for asylum in Mexico, with the stipulation that if they continued onward to the U.S. They, and were rejected, the offer was rescinded. And he indeed kept his word on that one. 
At this point, a pathway to citizenship for migrants who have been here for at least 20 years and have absolutely no criminal record would be one step in the right direction, alongside hiring more judges to speed up the asylum hearings that are already scheduled and backlogged. And that's a wrap for this story. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button and comment down below. Give me your ideas on how we can solve this crisis in an altruistic, albeit rational way.